Father God, we thank you for this beautiful time you've given us, oh Father God, to spend some time in your presence, Father. Lord, to be here, oh Father God, is the, uh, one of the greatest things, oh Father God. Lord, we know the weather outside is not good, it's cold, but Father, I thank you for keeping all of us safe, oh Father God. Thank you for being with us, oh Lord, as I'm speaking from your word, oh Father God, that it be your words and not mine, oh Father God. I um, give myself to your hands, oh Father God. I pray that you use me as a vessel in your hands, oh Father God. I give everything to your hands, oh Father God. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you for the opportunity to share the word today. So, um, um, this is supposed to be the youth message. So, um, I'm sure, I am sure um, the youths are watching me online because I have an exciting message today. So, <laughs> um, so uh, first of all, full disclaimer: I am not, well. I'm going to be speaking about Valentine's Day. I am not saying anyone. I'm telling, not telling anyone to find a Valentine. Okay, don't parents, don't ask me. Okay, I'm not conveying that message. Okay, so we all know what tomorrow is, right? It is Valentine's Day. We have heard messages about it. You know, whenever um, it is that time of the year, we always hear something about Valentine's Day. So I'm, I don't want to go into the details or history of it, but um, I would like to put a challenge to all our youngsters this uh, Valentine's Day. I know we don't celebrate it, you know, that is full disclaimer as well, like we don't celebrate it. But um, I would like to challenge all our youths to get closer to Jesus Christ at this Valentine's Day. So um, in the world, we will take this time to get closer to a person they love or, you know, propose or whatever it is, right? So we don't want to go into that. But I want to put the challenge today to get closer to God, closer to Jesus Christ. Ask Jesus Christ to be your Valentine, right? So, you know, we know during this time, uh, people have seen roses or love letters or whatever, right? Like it is the love season. So, um, but what has Jesus given us? Jesus give, has given us the greatest love letter, right? The Bible. So it has everything that we need. When we go through certain situations in our life, it has instructions that show, tells us what to do. And also it shows this love towards us. Right? There are verses in the Bible that says, hey, I love you, okay? I don't care, like, if you don't have anyone, I love you, right? So the Bible says a lot of things about Jesus' love towards us. So... What does God want from us? So when we um, say about things, um, specifically like when we ask Jesus to be our Valentine, what does he want from us? When we decide to dedicate our lives to God, what does he want from us? He doesn't want our overpriced Hallmark cards, because we, know, we all know it's all of us. He doesn't want that. He doesn't want any of our gifts. We don't want to, you know, he doesn't want us to purchase like, expensive gifts and give it to him. He doesn't want that. And he doesn't expect anything from us but our time, but ourselves. He expects ourselves to be submitted for him, to surrender our lives for him. And also he expects our time, right? So he would like you and me to spend time with him. So today, let us look at what God offers us. So now we've decided to keep Jesus as our Valentine. So let us see what he offers us as a Valentine or like he's a, as a lover or as a friend. What is he offering us? So when God says, I love you, what does he mean? So when we say, I love you to someone that means something, right? So when God says, or when Jesus says, I love you, what does it mean? So first thing, it's a, it means my love for you is faithful. The first thing when he says, I love you, he means that my love for you is faithful. No matter what, um, whoever loves you, no matter whoever in this world loves you, they can be unfaithful, right? But Jesus is saying that my love for you is faithful. So for that, let us read Deuteronomy 7 verse 9. Deuteronomy 7 verse 9. Know therefore that the Lord thy God, he is God, the faithful God, which keepeth covenant and mercy, with them that love him and keep his command, commandments to a thousand generations. So it says that, therefore the Lord thy God, he is God, he is the faithful God. 
So he is only faithful God that um, who keeps his covenant not to just not to us only, but to a thousand generations. So when he is promising us his love, he is saying that he will be a faithful God. So no matter what you need in your life, no matter like what situation what situation you are in, he will always be there for you. So the second thing that he's saying is, my love for you is forever. So Jesus is saying that his love for you is forever. It doesn't mean like when it come when we compare it to the worldly love, it can diminish, it can go down because you know things can happen. So it can go down. But Jesus is saying that my love for you is forever. And we can see that in Psalm 136, verse 1 to 3. And it says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord for his good, for his mercy endureth forever. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Uh, God of God, uh, unto the God of gods, for his mercy endureth forever. O oh, give thanks to the Lord of lords, for his mercy endureth forever. So in KJV it says mercy, but in um, uh, NLV it says love. So that's why I picked that word. So his love endures, endures forever. So that love that Jesus is giving us is forever. So the third one, nothing can st stop me from loving you. So we can see that in Romans 8, verse 38 and 39. Can someone please read that verse? Romans 8, verse 38 and 39. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels nor principalities, nor powers nor things present nor things to come, nor height nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So there's a lot, a list of things that it, um, that we can see here, right? None of that can stop God from loving us, right? So uh, when God promises His love to us, He's saying that my God, well, nothing can stop this um, God from um, loving me. Nothing can stop God from loving me. So the next one I want to go to is my love for you is greater than you could ever imagine. So my love for you is greater than you could ever imagine. And we can see that in Ephesians 3, verse 17 to 18. Well, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye be rooted and grounded in love, may, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is what is the breadth and uh, length and depth that, and height. So it says that my love for you is greater than you could ever imagine. We cannot measure its breadth. We cannot measure its height. We cannot measure its length, right? It is not measurable. That means that it is from eternity to eternity. So, uh, you know, when we say I love you for uh, from eternity to eternity or like to the moon and back, what does it mean? You cannot measure, right? So that means my love for you is greater than you could ever imagine. God is promising us that. And also, uh, what does he want to do? Like, he want, what does he want us to do when he loves us? He wants us to share his love with others. In Micah 6 verse 8, it says, he wants to share, he wants us to share his love with others. So I would read that. It says, he has showed thee, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of thee, but to do justly and to love mercy and walk humbly with thy God. So it says that you know, we have to share that love, that love that God has given us with others. So here we see that Jesus is offering us, see what Jesus is offering us, right? So these verses evidently shows us what kind of love Jesus is giving us. So. So um, now we just saw the relationship that Jesus wants with us and, and Jesus is seeking from us. And let us now turn our attention to the story of the Samaritan woman. I know we all know the story. We've heard thousands of sermons about it. Everyone speaks about it. But I would like to share about how Jesus' love transformed her life. So um, in John 4, verse 1 to 6, 1 to 26, we see the story, right? I don't want to go deep into the verses or anything, but John 4 verse 5, it says, Then cometh he to a city of Samaria, which he called, which, which is called Sychar, near the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus therefore being very with his journey, sat just on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. 
there cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said unto her, Give me to drink. So we know the story. We know the background of the story where, you know, Jesus was tired. He sat down next to the well and he asked the Samaritan woman for the water, right? So we um, all know the conversation that they had between each other. So um, from the story, it is very evident that uh, the Jews ever hardly spoke to the Samaritans, right? So especially that person being a woman, that was a big no-no at that time. So for a Jewish man to talk to a Samaritan woman, that was a big no-no at that time. So we know that in India also, back in the days there were the caste system and then you know, people wouldn't talk to the, high, the, lower, the higher caste, wouldn't talk to the lower class people. So we know that, that story as well. So that was the same thing in Jesus' time as well, where the Jews did not want to have anything to do with the Samaritans, right? But Jesus being a Jew, it was a big no-no. At that time, Samaritans were uh, considered as second-class citizens, right? And also, let us say, okay, talking is another thing, but drinking from a Samaritan woman, don't even think about it. That is the kind of situation that uh, there was at that time. It was considered unclean by Jewish law. So imagine her shock at that time. When Jesus asked the Samaritan woman to give him some water, Imagine like, I want you all to go to that story where let us say that we are there, we are the Samaritan woman and Jesus is next to you. Like, and as a Samaritan woman, we all know what um, the distinction between the Samaritans and Jews. Imagine what would your reaction be? Be like, oh my God, why are you here? Why are you bothering me, right? You're not even supposed to talk to me, let alone you're asking to drink from the water I drew out of the well, right? So. I will be in shock. I don't know how I would deal with that situation. She was calmer than, you know, when I imagined she was calmer, right? So that is exactly how Jesus comes to you. We think our, um, we're not worth enough. Uh, we might have our, uh, we might think, uh, okay, I don't think I can do this, or I, I don't think I'm worthy enough. Uh, we might have low self-esteem. We might have rejection issues because, you know, when, when we go through certain things, we might face all of these things. We might have depression, we might have anxiety, we might have that inferiority, right? When Jesus came to her, that might be exactly the things that she felt. She might have felt, oh my God, like I am not worthy to even stand in front of him. I'm not worthy to even uh, speak to him. I am inferior to him. So all of that thought might have came to her, right? But we, um, we, we also have all these issues in certain life situations, especially when it uh, comes to ministry, uh, when we you know, even want to share the gospel with someone, we step back. We think, okay, I'm not worthy enough for that. I don't think I can do this. You know, there are other things who, other people who do it better than me. So, but why does Jesus approach her? From the story, we can see that he doesn't care about your class. He doesn't care about your social class. He doesn't care about what you are going through, but he is there for you. But whenever, like, when, whenever you feel that way, whenever, like, you know, I feel that way, I look at the story and be like, okay, Jesus came to the Samaritan woman, right? So he approaches us because he still loves us, right? No matter what we have done in our lives, when we repent and when we come back to Christ, his love is still there for us. So we can uh, we know from her story that she was ashamed of her life. She longed for love. She didn't want to be disturbed because you know she already said, "Hey, what are you doing here?" Right? And she was also desperate. She wanted the water, right? So Jesus asked about her life. We all know the story, like where he acknowledged her previous life, and that didn't stop him from asking for a drink or having a conversation with her. Jesus being the God, he knew everything about her. Every single thing that um, she went through, she has about her husband, about her life, she knew, he knew it already. But he still sat next to her and had a conversation with her, right? So all that we, uh, all that we have done in our past will not prevent, from, uh, prevent God from loving us. Whatever we have done in the past, when we acknowledge that, when we know, okay, when we 
uh, acknowledge that God, I was wrong, or God, I know these are the things that happened in my life. When we acknowledge that, it will not prevent God from loving us. So Jesus wants to be our Valentine, right? Let us go back to the Valentine's Day thing. Jesus wants to be our Valentine, right? But he wants to shower us with his love. So when we compare Jesus' love to um, somebody else's love, it's completely different. When he says he loves you, when Jesus says, I love you, he means it. It's not like, okay, I love you because. No. I love you. It means it. That three words means everything. When Jesus says he loves you, he's not looking at your circumstances. He's not looking at your um, situations. He's not looking at your life. He still loves you. He loves you. And also, at the end of the story, Jesus offers our eternal life, right? So, um, Jesus could have gotten the water. Him being God, what is impossible for him? He could have just went there, we, we, you know, in the beginning of the chapter, it says he was thirsty. He could have just um, gone there and just drew water from the well, right? He is the God who does miracles. He could have just done it all by himself, but he was there just for her. Somewhere else, but like he could have gone to somewhere else, right? You know, he, when he came from uh, the place, he could have gone through somewhere, or by some area. Why that specific well? Because Jesus wanted to have an encounter with that Samaritan woman and change her life for good, right? So no matter how far we are, Jesus will go all the way for us. We, we all are in different walks of our life. No matter how far away we are from God, He will come to you. So when He comes to you, accept His love, right? So uh, I want you all to place yourself in the place of that woman right now and think, when. Jesus comes to you, have you gone far away or have you asked him, hey, I want that eternal life. I want your love. I want what you offer, right? So um, in return to God's love to us, we have to love him, right? Love is not a one way thing. We have to love him back, right? So how can we love him back? We have to obey his commandments. We have this Bible that is given to us, right? We have to obey his commandments. It has all, everything that you need to do is in this Bible. So we have to obey his commandments. Believe his word. Spend time with him in prayer, in reading the Bible. Spend time with him. And also share his love with others. We heard about it before. So God has placed us, maybe like you think, okay, God, why are you placed, why have you placed me in this specific community? or in this specific church, or in this specific college, or wherever we go, there is a reason behind it. Because Jesus wants you to share his love with others. Because you you have his love. You are loved by Jesus. But now Jesus wants you to share that with others. And also, we have to thank him for the good and bad. Don't always go to him when you are good. When you are good and bad. We have to thank him because every situation, because you know, if you look at the story of the Samaritan woman, you know, she went through shame. She had a past life. That is why, like Jesus went to her and spoke about her, right? So, in our good and bad, thank God, because there is a reason why we're going through all that. And also push into him when things get hard. Lean on him. You know, when you say when um, Jesus says, I love you. He is also promising that I will be there for you when things get hard or when you go through certain situations where you don't know where to go to, lean on him. Or like when you have questions where you are not sure about, just lean on him. He's there to answer you. And also, more or anything, enjoy his presence. You know, there is happiness in his presence. When Jesus is there for you, you know, you will feel his presence very closely. So enjoy his presence. So um, when we uh, put that into our ministry context, we will all go to schools, colleges, or workplaces, or wherever we are placed, right? So he did not just come for us. If, it, he, if he only came for my forefathers or someone else, I wouldn't be standing here today, right? If he only came for one person, I wouldn't be standing here today, or we wouldn't be here today. He came for everyone. So he came for the women, he came for the children, oppressed, poor, wealthy, marginalized, Jews, Gentiles, powerful, lowly, wealthy. Like, no matter who you are, he came for you, right? So we don't put a, a mark where, okay, Jesus only 
came for this specific people. And I'm just going to use our community. Oh, Jesus only came for the Malayali people. No. He came for every single person that he created. Right? But we just have to acknowledge his love. We just have to accept his love and love him. And also, no social status or rank hinders Jesus um, from the faith. Didn't hinder, well, no social social status or rank in their inner Jesus from effective ministry. You know, him being a Jew, why did he go to the summer tournament? Right? We have to think about it. If that didn't stop Jesus, we are the hands and feet of Jesus on his earth now. We have to take that. That's a big responsibility. When you say, uh, when I say I'm a Christian, it's not just a denomination. We all say it's a relationship. But above that, there's a responsibility, right? So when Jesus says, I love you, we have to do it for him, right? When we have that close relationship with, with Jesus, we have to do all these things. Like, don't let anything hinder you from sharing the word of God. So um, I really challenge everyone to ask Jesus to be your Valentine as well. And then say, and saying it again, we don't celebrate it, but you know, we just have to give Jesus the space to come into our life. Because many times we put put a hindrance to that. We are the hindrance sometimes in our lives. Because we don't open up. We don't acknowledge the presence of God enough. So may God bless you with us.